Tim, so thank you so much for the kind introduction. And I am sur very surprised and uh, I'm, I'm very happy that Dr. Omar is joining. Uh, we go back uh, when I did my FCPS in medicine and Dr. Omar was my supervisor. So this is uh, really a special opportunity for me. So thank you so much for that. Uh, my name is Faiz, Faiz Anwar. Uh, I know once you read the, the spelling, you can spell it, you can call it Faiz or Faiz, but my name is Faiz, so thank you. Uh, I do not have any conflict of interest with this presentation. So this is the um, rough roadmap of my presentation. Um, and this is introduction to a process. And I think that's why intent is to uh, invite you guys to join us in the process. So the contents include why publish um, and what are the components of a balanced academic portfolio that will be mostly for the junior people, students and resident. And then we did a survey of the students. So I will share some slide and that may be educational for most of us uh, who have not seen this slide before. What are the barriers to publication? And briefly, what's the role of mentoring and the type of publications and scholarly activities our students and young trainees can start with? Uh, and what are the predictors of their productivity if they want to participate? I will have some examples to share. Uh, I've been doing this for now 10 years since I became a faculty. Uh, and then uh, I have some resources just to touch about motivation and mentoring. And we have developed a mini curriculum, mostly for the scholarly publications. So that's some training resources I'm going to share. And I truly believe that excellence is a process. And if you are on that process, sky is the limit. So how big is the scope? I was just Googling uh, how many students are in Pakistan and I found this resource from 2019. And according to this, almost 150,000 students appear in the entry test. And out of those 15,000 will get admission in more than 100 public and private sector med medical colleges in Pakistan. So if we can perfect the process of mentoring, if we get it right, we get to serve and help a very large number of very highly talented individuals in Pakistan. So a medical student may ask, you know, why bother publishing? And for that particular student, my answer is that if you want to learn at a higher level, you have to publish. Um, you need to get involved in the innovation and research and then ultimately publish it if you have any desire to change the world, if you want to prevent the disease, if you want to control diseases better, or if you ultimately find cures for the disease, you have to get involved into innovation research and publishing. If you want to provide the best care to my family, to your family, to provide that high quality care, you have to involve in publishing and scholarly activities. If you want to serve at, with excellence at your local level, regional level, national level, at a global level, it's only possible if you get involved in publishing. And if you want, if you have ambitions, big dreams, uh, you want to go into higher education, these days residencies here in the United States and I'm sure everywhere else, residencies or fellowships are very competitive. So you need to have a strong portfolio. Um, and it is um, becoming more and more a requirement for your job. If you have a dream job in mind, you cannot succeed in getting that job without publishing. It is now required for promotion and tenure. People here in the US are very well familiar about that. And we know the, in our academic environment here, either you publish or perish, so you make a choice. So what we have done in the last 10 or so years, uh, we got involved in some uh, free residency students training um, and help them achieve academic success. Uh, I have uh, published with more than 200 people who are now resident within the USA. Uh, 35 of uh, those people who work with us and publish with us, they are now into fellowships. And my specialty is hemonks, so most of these guys in hematology oncology. And we now currently in this group are loosely working with about 600 students on different groups and try to help them. And our um, research and publication focus been around either therapeutics, drug development, malignant hematology management, 
uh, to learn more about the disease biology, drug resistance, immunotherapy, cellular therapy, stem cell transplantation, and explore novel targets. And uh, my personal focus is mentoring for academic success for these students. So when I was a medical student, uh, this is what I was looking at my portfolio. And I was thinking if I'm in a medical school and working hard, if, if I'm scoring good and getting A grades, uh, I'm doing really good. And if uh, I, at the same time, uh, get a good, rich clinical experience, my portfolio is strong and balanced. But years later, I realized that this is very incomplete view of anybody who wants to be a comprehensive, good, educated physician. So then I realized what is missing. And there I can show you what were my blind spots. So I was completely missing the importance of publication and scholarly activities. I was missing that I need to not only get educated, I need to get involved in teaching, I need to involve in volunteering, and it is important to have uh, some hobbies. Uh, you need to be a good fit within any team and you need to be a team player, you need to collaborate. You, you cannot just win by working alone. And, and if you have leadership qualities, that will give you extra credit to be more successful. Now I go back to the previous slide and if I want to score on any scoring system uh, where they are selecting people for a job or for the training, then I'm going to only get scores on these three categories. But if I'm aware and I'm, my portfolio is balanced and then I am putting an extra effort on all these areas, which many people have as a blind spot, then of course, at the end of the interview, at the end of the evaluation, my scoring sheet will tell a completely different story. So this is where you need to have a balanced portfolio to be successful as a young physician. So how to do that now, if you have a definition of success, you have life agenda. So you start with the foundation and I cannot emphasize more uh, about the uh, importance of honesty, authenticity, and integrity. And then based on those foundations, you need to have a strategy. And the strategy which we know works is your knowledge base, your talent, your attitude, your ambitions, uh, dream big, work hard, work smart, acquire skills, remain humble, and acquire wisdom. And by doing that, then provide the excellent uh, service um, and through that excellent service, you can work on, continue to get educated, continue to publish and get involved in teaching, work as a team player and get involved in research. So this is the survey and I think I want to spend maybe two minutes on this slide. Um, I have a group of uh, students from Pakistan, they are on a WhatsApp group and we ask them you know, you are involved in the group and many are now publishing. So what was missing in your training or skill level that you guys were not able to publish without, before you join us? And they gave us some answers. We clumped those answers into different categories and we sent them the questionnaire back and we said, now we have clumped your answers into 10 different categories. Why don't you rank these categories uh, based on your perception of importance. So rank number one category will be the more important thing. And rank number 10 will be kind of least important on the list. There's no denial. We have exceptionally good teachers back home. And I am one of the end product of those teachers uh, and got directly benefit from that. But what student came back and they said they, they, they have, um, a severe lack of inspiring role models. Uh, they truly have good teachers, but they don't have good mentors. And they feel that for scholarly activities, there is no nurturing environment and there is lack of guidance and resources there. Uh, and then said they have uh, inadequate knowledge how to do it. They don't have skill how to publish. Um, many came back and they said, there's no online library access. And they maybe this is where APNA can make a difference. This is where APNA can look at the individual colleges and universities and see where we can uh, get access for these students uh, through their comprehensive online libraries. 
Uh, and many people came back, they said, we have some skills, but there is no dedicated funding stream. There is no systematic approach. No one gives us a reward if we work hard on this. Uh, some people felt that, uh, so these two categories are ranked the same, uh, rank five and six, that was the, there's no uh, teamwork for collaboration. Um, generally, students are overburdened. Uh, the trainees are underpaid and there's a lot of, uh, low self-esteem issues, family social burdens. Uh, they are unaware of their own talent. Uh, they are unclear of their professional path, uh, ambitions, they have lack of vision. They, they do not want to take any risk and they are concerned about failure. The rank seven was uh, kind of similar theme, but lack of nurturing environment. Uh, there's no academic culture to support critical thinking and tolerance for how and why. Um, and that's where as a teacher, as an educator, we need to encourage our students for free thinking and encourage them to ask us in quest questions. Um, and then some people came back that the brain demise is a big issue. Some felt that brain drain may be a problem, but many people said it's a brain demise. There's a lot of talent, but because of lack of mentoring, they feel that we are losing all the talent. And many people, they felt that they, they were not aware that they, they never thought about our life agenda, their goal, their success, how to define uh, a lifelong learning and excellence. And many people, especially females, uh, and younger females, when they get married, there's a lot of social pressure, uh, there's lack of family support that they cannot really pursue their higher education. So if a young, scholar come, we tell them what we cannot change. We will not be able to change whatever score they got before going into the mentoring program. Uh, good scores are important. We cannot really change the year of graduation. Fresh graduates in general are preferred. International medical graduate from good reputable medical colleges may have a good sound background in training, a clinical skill, their alumni support is better, and they have better educational resources. And so we cannot truly change all these uh, things which happened in the past, but what we can change is still a lot. We can change a person's mindset. We can tell them to look at the life agenda and aim higher, be more confident. And we do that by giving them skills. We remove their blind spot. We tell them to be more ethical, uh, have uh, integrity in their day-to-day uh, meeting, uh, punctuality, skill building for scholarly activities and work as a team player. You know, as a medical student, uh, when we were competing to make the merit and competing to get the you know, higher numbers, we were competing individually. The scholarly activities, you have to work uh, in a team environment. And then by doing all these things, we help them publish and there are different type of publication that can be done. Um, and then we we tell them if you acquire a skill, why don't you teach? And you can teach this a small group of five people or 10 people and write that in your portfolio. And that will help you become better teacher, better communicator. And this is all trickled down. This all trickles down into your portfolio. And then there has to be a meaningful change in your CV in your portfolio before the mentoring program and after the mentoring program which may take somewhere between six months to a year because that's how much time you need really to start seeing your projects getting published. And all this trickles down into your personal statement and your job application becomes stronger. We can guide you how to improve your statement and letter. We can help you with the language edits and content edits. And this is typically done by a senior person trying to help a junior colleague or a resident who is already into residency can look at the application of somebody who's applying for residency. And peers have the opportunity to help each other and prepare for the interviews and guidance on the interview process and application process. And now with all that portfolio, you go to somebody and you show them your CV and you say, please write me a letter of recommendation. You are not going to get a weak letter of recommendation. You're going to get a strong letter of recommendation. So for an example, through all this process, I work with about 30 students back in 2018. And uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, that all 30 out of 30 are doing now internal medicine or other residencies in the USA. 
So that 100% result came from their hard work, their ambition, and their effort. Uh, but I can tell you that mentoring can make a huge difference. And there are some people for other visa reasons or whatever, they are uh, unable to apply right away for fellowship. So we encourage them to look into yes, doing a part-time MPH, a master's degree, get ready for the fellowship uh, and look for a part-time research job. And if they can, they should consider maybe a part-time PhD to continue to improve your portfolio. And for the medical students, so what type of easy publications which can be done in the beginning, I say start with a single case report or maybe an image report. And if you have more mature uh, understanding about a subject, start with just writing a letter to the editor. And if you have access to few cases, start with the case series. Uh, you can also write a focused review. Uh, you can also do a systematic review. And if you know how to handle the data, you can do a meta-analysis. Uh, if you have access to data back home, uh, you can do a retrospective review. Uh, prospective trials are generally take longer time, higher quality, but is probably more suitable for somebody who's starting as a junior faculty. And if they can, they should spend some time, even a month, uh, into a basic like basic science lab and try to see how to do different laboratory techniques. This is my personal perception, and I tell my student: if you want to be if you want to be highly productivity, you need to have a focus. You need to have self drive. You need to have dedication. You need to give and seek for feedback, and that's where we we really lack in that aspect. I have to beg my students to give me feedback on a weekly basis. If they came to me and we gave them a project and they just disappear in a vacuum. You never hear back them. But those people who tell you every week that you know, we have made a progress, um, they're the one who will have more papers and more productivity. Work as a group and build your skills. Without that, there's no productivity. So a few examples I'm sharing, just a simple case got published in a Nature's Journal in the bone marrow transplantation I'm not going to spend too much time on these examples. This is an other example of a publication which got published in the American Society of Bone Marrow Transplant Journal. This is one of the leading North American journal for the American Society of Bone Marrow Transplant. Now we call it uh, Transplant and Cellular Therapy Society. And the first uh, uh, author, Avazi Jaz, is a graduate from uh, Rawalpindi Medical College. Uh, Ali Yunus Khan is a graduate from Shifa College. Spadullah is a graduate from Army Medical College, Warda Army Medical College, Asad Faraz, uh, Raval Pindi Medical College. So this is just an example of all these people coming together, working together and publishing in the leading journals in the world. As another example, uh, you know, anything very simple, you know, prophylaxis of a hepatitis B after the stem cell transplant, in the era of drug resistance. And, and there are a lot of students who got involved and many are now faculty. Irbaz is now a Mayo faculty, hematology oncology and a Mayo fellow doing two additional master's degrees in Harvard. Um, similarly, I have uh, success stories for all these names. Uh, this was a recent publication in JAMA. We came up with a letter to the editor uh, we analyzed the data on the carfilzomib-based chemotherapy, and we concluded that there are some pluses and minuses, so all that glitter is not gold. And Zonera is uh, from RMC. Uh, she's part of the co-author list, and she started working with us before she went into residency. Uh, this is uh, just to tell the, um, the primary and the secondary literature and hierarchy or the importance of the data of the research and uh, innovation and how the, what is the weightage of the evidence. So I will spend maybe a couple of minutes here. Uh, this is for the medical students. Um, and I want to explain um, the anatomy of an article, how somebody who just picks up a journal and reads it. And then I am trying to help somebody publish 
how we look at it differently. So on the left hand, you get a published article, you read there's a title, there are authors, there are disclosure information, there is a corresponding author, they have an address, a mail, email address there. Then it starts with an abstract, an introduction, it has a description about methodology, they talked about results, they sometimes give results in tables and figures, they have a nice discussion, four or five paragraphs, and then they give references. When someone comes and say, I want to write a good review on the management of X, Y, and Z, we start with the idea. We say, let's convert this idea into hypothesis. Let's convert this hypothesis into a title. And then we try to gather a team around it. And that may take us uh, you know, somewhere between one to two weeks. And once we have the hypothesis and we know our focus, then we uh, initiate a search. So let's assume that this is sort of a, a, a high quality review paper you want to write. So you start with the research on the library resources, you define your methodology, you collect your references, and then you select the article you want to finally include in your data selection. And then you extract data from those articles into tables those tables are converted into results. And when we do that, we have the ability to now initially present our initial results in any relevant meeting. So this process within one to three months, you can have an abstract ready, which you can present. And then as time go by, uh, you start writing your introduction, you start developing your discussion portion, you start developing your figures and legends, um, and then you write a letter to the editor, you select the journal, you make final edits and you submit it. And that may take an additional three, three months. So total process up to this point is probably six months when you submit. And after submission, it may take an additional three to six months before it can get reviewed and published. And many times the reviewers come back, they say it's not good. Sometimes they say it's good, but you need minor or major edits. Um, and when it gets published, you have to do proofreads and you, you, you work with the publisher forms. So this entire process may take up to a year before you can publish one paper. So many a time students say, you know, I'm working with you for two weeks and I have not seen any progress. You're right, it's not going to be any different in two weeks. In two weeks, we'll be lucky if you can develop some basic skills. So you need to plan ahead. If you want to apply for the interview by the end of uh, next year, you need to start working today. So the process is start with an idea. And I showed a paper where we talked about graph versus host disease in the setting of checkpoint inhibitors. And many people, they were reporting that the graph versus host disease happened in patients who were previously exposed to checkpoint inhibitors. And if they went through an allergenic transplantation, and we felt that there is no prospective trial, there is no big data out there. So if we look at the individual evidence, which is scattered here and there, we may be able to make sense of the data. That's what we did. We quantitatively measured the risk and tried to define patients who are at a higher risk and low risk to save lives, to improve care, to help uh, people who are actually dealing with these problems. And then with that, we came up with the recommendation. And so this is the educational component, discovery component we want to highlight through any, through any project. And this is where the role of a mentor comes in. If uh, we say, you know, student do all the work and publish, that's not going to happen. This is just an example. You know, someone writes the paragraphs and send it to me uh, or send it to another colleague, I can do either track changes electronically, or if I'm busy, I print it out and keep it with me. And whenever I'm traveling, I have time, I can uh, hand write and correct. So this is where we need mentors. This is uh, where you know, we cannot really say students need to do all its own. They need to work with a disease expert, a specialist, and that's where most of the time is consumed. Uh, but that's where the most reward is. So I have some examples to share with our collaborations uh, from uh, Pakistan, where the data was from Pakistan. So we have a fantastic uh, Armed Forces Institute of Bone Marrow Transplant data. They have a wonderful team there. So we collaborate with them and publish some of their data. 
they are actually the leader in the world on management of uh, aplastic anemia, uh, especially in that part of the world. You cannot really use data from New York and London and say you are going to treat your patients uh, based on that data and provide them the best care in Lahore, Karachi, or Islamabad. You need to look at your own challenges and you need to have your own data to provide the best care for those, for those patients. So this is another example with the same group um, in, uh, in uh, rare disorders. Uh, they, they published their single center experience from Pakistan. And this is a list of the hematology related uh, meetings where we can submit abstracts. Uh, once we have the data available, we can convert it to an abstract. So American Society of Hematology, American Society of Clinical Oncology, Transplant Society, European Transplant Society, and similarly, there are other societies for every specialty. You guys know your societies well. So if you want to put a team of students together, what will be the ideal team? Uh, the ideal team should have maybe four or five people in the beginning. Uh, there may be one or two students that are, could be resident and fellows. Uh, so they have a little bit more clinical know-how and experience. Uh, one or two very beginner or junior students, one or two mentors. Uh, they should have access to library and a statistician and the skills, just basic skills, you know, type a paragraph in the word, use Excel sheet, uh, start making some tables. They need to learn about database searches, uh, how to make graphs and figures, how to use uh, citation software. Our group uh, predominantly uses EndNote, but you can use any. And you can use many platforms for collaboration where you can put your file together so they are visible to everybody. We typically rely on a Dropbox folder for coordinations. And there are many resources uh, available online where you can find a list of journals uh, based on the impact factor, based on your specialty area. And that's where you pick and choose. Um, and I will suggest, you know, start with an impact factor somewhere between one and five. Uh, in the beginning, and as you learn more, get more maturity, more knowledge, then you aim for uh, a better impact factor. So I typically share these three YouTube resources or speeches uh, for the motivation. Uh, I, I, I um, invite you guys on this meeting, on this forum to please listen to this. Uh, a good time will be if you have some free time for 20, 30 minutes and you're going out for a walk, just type in these uh, uh, commencement addresses in, uh, in your cell phone, in the YouTube and listen to that. The, the, my most favorite is this, uh, the number three, uh, make your bed speech, which was uh, del delivered by uh, Admiral Williams in in their commencement address at University of Texas in Austin in 2014. Now, this is a resource, uh, one of a cardiothoracic uh, physician who is our fund graduate, is a good friend. He introduced me to this resource. Uh, this is also on YouTube. It's called View from the Top. And it is the lecture series which are given by the world leaders. Uh, at Stanford Graduate School of Business. And this is a free resource. You could actually have access to 100 plus uh, lectures. Just an example, uh, the Google CEO gave a lecture to the students. Uh, uh, JP Morgan CEO gave a lecture. The Treasury Secretary gave a lecture. Uh, HP uh, CEO gave a lecture. Uh, the, uh, there is a investment firm, uh, Vinod Kosola gave a lecture. These are all free online resources available. This may be more suitable for the faculty and opens up your mind. So give it a try. We have over the years developed some very basic lectures. They're not fancy, but they, they do the trick. They introduce you to the basic concept. We want your help to continue to develop more basic training resources. We were uh, on the APNA forum, we were talking about developing some resources and someone said very rightly that there's no need to reinvent the wheel. There are many resources which are already available, so we will utilize that. But if you want to summarize, uh, we can make an effort and summarize resources. So we don't have to give the lecture every week. It's available, new students join in, they just need to spare some time 
affect the link less than the lecture, develop some skills and move on. Uh, this is a very, very basic uh, mini curriculum. These are about resources available on the internet and they are there um, available to anyone. So, and if you want to help us by adding more, improving these resources, we'll be glad to remove uh, a previous resource and upgrade to a better one. So let us know. This was, uh, this was helped and contributed by a team of students who are working with us currently. Similarly, additional resources which are available on the websites. And additional resources um, about the uh, meta analyses and systematic reviews. Additional resources about study question and hypotheses. So this is what I tell my student. Um, we tell them that we have been publishing uh, one to two piece or article every week for almost three plus years now. And this is their hard work. They are able to do it and collaboratively we continue to publish. Uh, we have directly or indirectly have helped 35 people enter into very, very prestigious fellowships and academic jobs. They are the one with the talent. They are one with the hard work. Uh, we, this process just help them uh, get the advantage of all their unique strengths. And we have now published with more than 200 pre-residency applicants um, and they are pursuing their career in different uh, institutions all over the USA, Alhamdulillah. So how the process starts, you know, someone reaches out, uh, they know somebody, they know their friend got benefit from us, they, they, their senior, their junior is working with us, so they send an email, uh, we start with the basic CV review. The student has to agree to be uh, some basic terms and conditions, uh, integrity, work as a team. We add to a WhatsApp group and a Dropbox. It has some training videos, resources. Uh, we start with uh, some idea and our focus need to be clear. Are we talking about through analysis, find some new aspect which is not known before? Or you want to just, uh, educate in a better way about an idea, about a process which is already well known. And then we try to gather a team of uh, students around that new idea, mentors facilitate that. Um, and then we, we want mentors to be very, very respectful. Uh, they should encourage junior people, um, they should support um, and they should give them feedback. And this is a very intense process with the initial manuscript go through multiple revisions. And once it's ready for submission, we select a journal, we write a cover letter, we submit it. And when the reviewers come back, based on the reviewers comment, we address it, we publish, celebrate, alhamdulillah, repeat, move on. And so we have done that for multiple times in the last few years, every week. 